All right, what up, guys? Linear equation, classroom problems. Let's go. Write the point slope form of the equation of each line. Remember that point slope is that uh, y is equal to m times x minus x1 plus y1. So you got to be trying to make that up best you can. Then if ap applicable, write the answer in slope intercept form. So slope intercept form is probably what you're used to from geometry or previous years. Y equals mx plus b. Here we go. Number one, number one should be a freebie. The reason why it's a freebie is it is a flat line. Any flat lines have a slope of zero, which means that this m is zero, goes away completely, and we get y equals y1, or simply what the y value is all the time. The y value here is one the whole way through, and that is it. And this is the uh, if applicable part, because uh, this is the slope intercept and the point slope form for this line. All right, so number two, I'm gonna show this two different ways. First of all, um, in my opinion, you should be making this as easy as possible on yourself. And if I simply started, for instance, right here and ended up right here, then I have gone over one, two and up one. That is to say my change in X was two and my change in Y was one. Change Y over change of X is your slope. So we would just simply say our M is a half. For writing our point slope form, we write y is equal to 1 half multiplied by x. And now we have to figure out what our x1 is. Our x1 is the coordinate which I started at. Please note, you could also use this coordinate up here. There's nothing wrong with that at all. However, I started at negative 2 comma 2. That starting point right there. And that means I got plus 2 plus 2. Be careful with this. Um, it's always the opposite sign for that x value, always different. So there's our point slope. To get to our slope intercept form, our slope intercept form, in the event this is a nice and easy question like this one, it is, then we just go ahead and uh, we could say it is y is equal to one half x, so it has that slope, and the intercept is just a boom three. Please note you could have also gotten that by distributing and adding like terms. Question three. Question three, same idea. I'm going to go ahead, pick a starting point, boom, ending point there. Boom. But this time, I'm going to go ahead and calculate it with the formula because the formula can't be useful to us. Our formula is our y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now, you might be thinking, Mr. Richards, why are you wasting your time with this? I can clearly count the squares, and you're right. Um, but I'm doing it this way just to show what different ways doing the question. So we started right there, um, and we have 1, 2. And we can also say this coordinate down there is uh, 2 comma negative 1. So our slope here is our second y value, negative 1, minus our first y value of 2, divided by our first x value of 2, minus our first x value of 1, and we get negative 3 over 1, which is just straight up negative 3. Continuing on, creating our equation, y is equal to negative 3, that's our m, times x, minus x1, so minus 1, plus 2. There's our beautiful slope-intercept form. Uh, quote point slope form, sorry. Our slope-intercept form, though, will be negative 3x, and then it looks like it crosses through uh, the 5 up there, so plus 5. And yet again, I could have gotten that 5 by doing negative 3 times negative 1. That's positive 3. Adding 2 is 5. Kaboom! Number 4. This time, I'm just going to do it normal. We're going down 1 over 1, so our change in y is negative 1. Our change in x is positive 1. Note how I did that, by the way. I did not say that I went left and then up. It's very important that you're always going from left to right. So um, as we go from left to right there, we have that uh, negative 1. And uh, therefore, our m is negative 1, negative 1 over 1. Um, and y is equal to negative 1 times x. And we got to pick a coordinate here. And just for clarity's sake, I guess I'm going to start up here just to make a point. So x minus 0 plus 5 is exactly the same thing as uh, our slope intercept form of negative 1x plus 5. Please note as well, you did not need the negative 1 in either of those. So you most likely would see other books do it kind of like this or like this. There is nothing wrong with that. And in some ways, it's actually even more standard not to write the 1 when you're multiplying. All right, let's go on to question number five. So question number five, you're going through the coordinate and you're again finding the point slope and the slope intercept. So now you don't have the graph, now you have to use the formula. So if you have to use your formula, our m is zero minus negative four. That is, by the way, where I got that from. I'm sorry, I kind of skipped some steps there. There's x1, there's y1, there's our x2. 
There's our Y2. And it actually might be helpful for some students if you're still not really seeing it all the way to actually write that out. X1 is equal to three. Y1 is equal to negative four. X2 is equal to two. Y2 is equal to zero. I'm not gonna write that out every single time, but it can be helpful for some students to write this on the side and then plug it directly into that Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1 formula. So Y2 minus Y1 over x2 minus x1 in this case is going to be a 4 divided by negative 1 or just a negative 4, um, which means it goes down 4 every single time you go um, to the right 1. After that, we can create our equation y is equal to negative 4 multiplied by x minus 3 minus 4 because it's x m times x minus x1 plus y1. There's our x1, our y1. So boom, that's our point slope form. To get to our slope intercept form, we do need to distribute. So to distribute, we got negative four X plus 12. We're doing our distributive property minus four. And now we add like terms, the 12 and the negative four come together to make eight. Here's our first answer and our second answer. Continuing on, doing exactly the same thing on problem number six. So in problem number six, we have um, this time our N is equal to, and again, X1, Y1, X2, Y2. We have two uh, minus four divided by zero minus five, and that's going to be negative two over negative five, which is two fifths. So our equation, we have two divided by five times x minus five plus four. We do need to be a little bit careful. We need to do our distributive property here, but it's not too big a deal. When we do two fifths times negative five, feel free to use your calculator, but the easy way to do this one in your head is five, um, and the negative five end up canceling out completely and you end up with just this x minus two plus four or y equals two over five x plus two. Please note, you could have also gotten this answer as a quote unquote freebie by noticing that this one right there was the um, y intercept right away because we had the x is zero, therefore the y gives you two. There'd be a very fast way to jump right to this answer of two down here. Let's continue on number seven. So going on to number seven, we have our n is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's going to give you a negative two over two, which is just negative one. So I'm going to practice doing it where we don't even write the negative one. We just write just the negative sign. It's a good habit to get into, kind of like I was talking about on that first page. So x minus zero and then minus two, which basically creates that uh, slope intercept version of the problem as well. Because you distribute the negative and it's just times zero. All right, question number eight. Question number eight, same exact thing. Our slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That gives you six divided by two, which reduces to three. Um, and yet again, y is equal to three times x minus zero minus one, which is just y equals three x minus one. Easy enough, good to go. Don't forget there are two answers to all these questions. There's the slope intercept and the point slope. So the point slope has the two answers thing and the slope intercept has not that. Continuing on, we're almost there. So we have done our first two pages. Let's continue on to the table practice. So it says if the table represents linear function, fill in the blanks, round all answers to one decimal place. So that means we do have decimals in this question and that's okay. The very first thing to do on any question like this is to create the equation of the line. So to create the equation of the line, we're gonna do exactly what we were doing before, label them up. If you need the help with it, I'll label them again this time. X1, X2, Y1, Y2. And um, therefore we'll have our M is equal to Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Um, and that's going to give you kind of a weird number. It's going to end up giving you a uh, negative 2.5 over 8, which you can just leave as is. However, you are able to write this um, as a fraction um, if you wanted to. I'd love to show you how to do that in the calculator. You can also do it in your head um, by multiplying by 2 over 2. So if I multiply by 2 over 2, I'll get 5 over 16. But let's show how we could do this in the calculator to get a non-decimal fraction. This is a good habit to get into. So negative 2.5 divided by 8, and then you hit map, enter, enter, and you'll get that negative 5 over 16. So 
The buttons again were just map, enter, enter to get us into that negative 5 over 16. Um, and that's going to give us that negative 5 over 16. Um, and again, you could have just used the decimal version of it. You could have simply rounded to the one decimal place. But the problem is, is this is only answers. It doesn't say anywhere that you have to write the formula down. And because it's just answers, if you simply rounded this to negative 0.3 early, you're going to get the wrong answer. So you do need to leave it like this for now. Anyways, our equation, y equals negative 5 over 16 times x plus 2 plus 4. If you've already forgotten what that formula is from, it's m. It's the equation. I'm going to write it in red right above it. It's y equals m times x minus x1 plus y1. There you go. We are good to go there, and yeah, it's plus 2 because minus negative is positive. There's our equation. Now, to figure out these ones, we're just going to plug in 0 and see what happens. I do think this is a great opportunity for us to uh, use the calculator, So, uh, but just to show you what you'd be writing into the calculator, negative 5 over 16 times 0 plus 2 plus 4. This is going to be equal to, um, let's see, time. Um, turns out this is 27 over 8. Um, and I think I'm just going to leave it like that. You, you technically could plug it into a decimal version of the answer. What the heck am I taking so long about it? So you can either write the 27 over 8, or you could write the approximate, it did say round to one decimal place, which is going to be 3.8. Four. So either one of those two answers is correct. Um, I think we're going to do the same thing for the value of 20 right now as well. So when we plug in the value of 20 um, for f of x, so f of 20, negative 5 over 16 times 20 plus 2 plus 4. So let's do that really quick. So you'll end up with... Um, negative 23 over 8. Um, so that's this one right here, which is approximately negative 2.9 if you chose to go that route. I, I really do prefer the fraction, though. I think the fraction is probably the better overall answer. Um, but it does say round to one decimal place, so maybe you could argue that you should be using the fraction. For the other half of the uh, problem, what we want to do is we're trying to find the y value and the y value is 0 and the y value is negative 30. So all you're going to do is you're going to take that same original equation over here and you're going to set the y value equal to 0. So now you have negative 5 over 16 x plus 2 plus 4. The best way to solve this question is going to start by subtracting 4 on both sides. So if we subtract 4 on both sides, we'll end up with negative 4 is equal to negative 5 over 16 times x plus 2. Then you want to get rid of fractions by multiplying both sides by 16. When you multiply both sides by 16, the 16s cancel. We get negative 64 is equal to negative 5 times x plus 2. And now we can finally solve it kind of the way you're probably used to. Negative 64 is negative 5x minus 10. Add 10 to both sides. We get negative 54 is equal to negative 5x. Divide both sides by 5. Negative 5. Sorry. And you'll just get negative 54 over 5. We can put that into this box over here. Negative 54 over negative 5, which is positive, by the way. I don't even know why it has become positive when you divide. Um, so this one over here, which is uh, exactly equal to this. When you divide by 5, you do get exact decimals of 10.8. So that one's not even a... That one doesn't really matter. You write a fraction or a decimal, you get exactly the same answer. For the rest of this here, now uh, we're doing exactly the same thing, uh, solving it for uh, negative 30. I'm not going to show the work because I have ran out of room, but um, well, maybe I will show the work. I'll show the work right here, which is the right small. I hope it is still visible on the video. All right, so we're going to go negative 30 is equal to, using that same equation, negative 5 over 16 times x plus 2 plus 4. Subtract 4 first again. Negative 34 is negative 5 over 16 times x plus 2. And now we're going to multiply both sides by 16. Negative 34 times 16. And that's going to give you negative 544 is equal to negative 5 times x plus 2. Negative 5x minus 10. Add 10 to both sides. Next is going to give you negative 534. And divide both sides by negative 5. 
and you end up with 534 over 5, which is approximately 106.8. That's a big number. I suppose that's what you got to do if you want to get that all the way to negative 30. I'll double check it. 106.8. This is the way you check your work, by the way. Just plug it in the original question. 106.8 plus 2 times negative 5 divided by 16 plus 4. Negative 30. There it is. Check your work. Boom, boom, boom. Continuing on. If the table represents a linear function, again, round the answer to one decimal place. Let's go. N is equal to 32 minus 8 y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 divided by 9 minus 3. This is going to be 24 over 6 is going to be exactly 4. So this one's not going to have really that many um, fractions anywhere. We got our y is equal to 4 times um, x minus 3 plus 8, our y2 minus y1 there, plugging in 0. This time uh, we have, when we plug in 0, our f of 0 is 4 times 0 minus 3 plus 8. And that's going to be plugging the calculator negative 12 plus 8 is negative 4. There's our first answer. We'll do the same exact thing, plugging in for 5. 4 times 5 minus 3 plus 8. Uh, looks like that's going to be 16. Yeah, perfect. And then after that, we also need to figure out what these two are. And again, let's just set the y value equal to 0 and solve for x here. Setting that up, we get 4 times x minus 3 plus 8. Subtract 8 on both sides first. Distribute the 4. Add 12. Divide by 4. Beautiful. Same exact thing. Negative 8 is equal to 4 times x minus 3 plus 8. Subtract 8 on both sides. Negative 16 equals 4 times x minus 3. Negative 16 is equal to 4x minus 12. Add 12 to both sides. Uh, and you get negative 4 is equal to 4x. Let's see, you get negative 1 this time. Really cool. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's go on to the word problems. Here we go. So word problem number one, Maxine was filling up her pool and it was taking too long to finish. The water was one foot off the bottom of the pool when she started her stopwatch and 2.5 foot off the bottom of the pool two hours later. So explain why the situation can be re reasonably described as linear. So um, anytime you want to be, you want to know like why it's uh, linear. If you have a why it's linear, it's because there is a constant rate of change constant rate of change, specifically the water um, coming out of a hose, because I see a fill up a pool coming out of the hose is constant. So it comes out at exactly the same rate the whole time. It doesn't sputter. It doesn't mess up. It's constantly coming out at exactly the same rate. Um, and that's the reason why. And now it says, find the uh, rate of change of the height of the water off the bottom of the pool, respect the time on Maxine's stopwatch. Any question you're trying to do that is like this, you need to figure out what is your X1, what is your Y1, and what is your X2, and what is your Y2. So we need to figure out some version of answers for these ones. So if you're figuring out some version of answers for these questions, um, our x1 is where we are starting, our x2 is where we're ending. The y1, like these are like these are inputs, right? So these are the inputs and the outputs. I think the output is the easiest part of this because the output is the height. Um, so the height of the water in this one starts off at 1, ends up at 2.5. The hard part here is realizing um, the the input. The input in this question is the time. It's how long it takes for the pool to go up. So it starts off at zero for the stopwatch and it ends up at two. And that is going to be all the information we need to find the rate of change. Our rate of change there um, is going to be, our M is going to be 2.5 minus one over two minus zero, which is 1.5 over two which is exactly 0.75. And let's be specific, 0.75 feet per hour. 
And it's just an H, by the way, for when you, um, yeah, right there. Um, here it says create a function H of T that gives the height of the water at time T after Maxine star started her stopwatch. So anytime you're creating a linear function, you want to go X minus X1 plus Y1. In this case, our Y is actually H of T. Our slope is that 0.75 we just found. Our X value is actually a T value. It's time is our input. We're starting off at time is zero and our original height is one. And we could even make this a little bit prettier and simply write the slope intercept version of the line, which is 0.75 t plus one, because we don't really need to write that minus zero, kind of a waste of time. So what is the height of the water when the stopwatch reads uh, one hour and 30 minutes? So remember the whole time we're doing this, this is all um, in hours for the time. So an hour and 30 minutes is one and a half hours. So if t is equal to 1.5, one and a half hours, our h of 1.5 is going to be 0.75 times 1.5 plus 1. I have no idea what that is. Um, looks like 2.125 uh, foot. And it's now that the pool is 6 feet deep, how long will it take for the pool to fill up? So now we just uh, make it 6 is equal to, make the y value equal to, we're solving for an output. So for solving for the output, we got 0.75 t plus 1, subtract 1 on both sides. And divide both sides by the 0.75. Use your calculator to do that. Don't try to do it in your head. There is no need. And you end up with 6.6 .6 repeating. So t is approximately 6.667. Please note, um, this is the chance for you to be very smart about it because this is in hours, right? <clears throat> well, 6.6 .6 repeating, that always happens when you have two thirds. Two thirds is the 0.666 uh, idea. So you have the six plus two thirds, right? This is like six plus two thirds. So really this is six hours, two thirds of an hour. If you divide an hour into three parts, you get 20 minutes. Two of those three parts, six hours, 40 minutes would be the perfect answer to this question. However, I would accept if you just did the 6.667 hours. Let's move on to the very last page. Here we go. So when taking a road trip, Adriana fills up her car, which holds 13.5 gallons of gas. After being on the road for an hour, she noticed that she had gone 72 miles and had 11 gallons left in the tank. And this reason can be, uh, this situation it can be described as linear because there is a constant rate of change, specifically gasoline being used to go distance. Over here, now it says, what is the miles per gallon average of Adriana's car? Round to the nearest whole number. Hint, miles per gallon means miles over gallons. Treat the miles as Y values and the gallons as X values. Remember, she has gone zero miles and she has a full tank of gas. Um, and that's how you do it. So it specifically tells you that you haven't used any gas whatsoever is X1 and zero. And it says our uh, X2 is how many um, gallons she had used. She used 2.5 gallons. Right? Did I say this right? Oh my gosh, guys, I apologize. I just made you guys write wrong material. I'm really sorry. Um, the gallons in her car, I reread re the problem just now. She starts off originally um, at 13.5 gallons. What am I saying? And when that happens, she has not moved. So the reality is she's gone 13.5 gallons in her car to start off with. And the X2, the second amount of gallons is 11 gallons. And this is zero miles. Our Y2 is 72 miles. To find that average rate of change, our Y, our N here is going to be our, um, I can't even speak, our N is going to end up being our Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, 13.5. And if we plug that into a calculator, we'll, well, get 72 divided by negative 
And again, good idea to plug it into a calculator. And you end up getting negative 28.8 miles per gallon. So, and it's a negative slope, by the way, um, because you are losing um, gallons as time goes on. Either way, 28.8 miles to the gallon is how much your car gets. Continue on, you do need to be careful to create a function, g of m, that has an input of miles driven and an output of gallons left in your John's tank since she filled up. So now you're flipping it upside down. It says g of m has an input of miles driven. So now it's the other way around. Um, so it says you can use the reciprocal of part B or start fresh. I'm going to start fresh just to uh, show it out. Um, so we'll have our x1. Now x1 has miles, so zero miles. Our y1 is our 13.5 gallons. And our x2 is going to be 72 miles. Um, and uh, I don't know why I wrote miles all the way up here. It's just mi. Uh, and our y2 is 11 gallons. And if we do it this way now, our m is going to be equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And if you notice, this is exactly the same thing as this, but upside down because you have changed the inputs and outputs. Um, and both of them are reasonable inputs and outputs for this exact situation. Regardless, you'd have um, 2.5 divided by 72. If you use that trick I showed you earlier uh, to change it into a fraction, you get negative 5 over 144. And if you instead chose to um, get a decimal version of the answer, you'd end up with, looks like, um, negative... 0.03472. I do like the fraction version of the answer though. It wants to create the function by the way. So g of m is equal to that slope negative 5 over 144 of x minus of m. Sorry, m is our input here. m minus our x1 of 0 plus our y1 13.5 gallons. And it basically says how long it's going to go. Um, in your car. How many gallons are left when she's driven 200 miles? So you got to replace that uh, M with a 200 this time. And uh, let's see, that's going to be times 200 plus 13.5. And it looks like you have approximately 65 uh, five, six gallons left in your car, which you could have also written as exactly um, a fractional answer of 59 over nine. However, I think you should be talking about decimals for gallons. And I really apologize if that um, sound showed up for everyone. So Windows alert, my oh my. How many miles will she have driven when she has half a tank left? So she has half a tank left um, that is half of her 13.5 gallons of gas. So you're talking about 13.5 divided by 2 has to equal the negative 5 over 144 times x minus 0 um, plus 13.5. And we have to solve this equation. Um, yeah, let's do some decimal version of it. So 13.5 divided by 2 is 6.75. We don't need to write the minus zero anymore. Subtract 13.5 on both sides. If you do that, you'll get negative 6.75. Multiply both sides by 144, and you get 972. It's negative 5x. Divide both sides by that negative 5. And you'll end up with x is 194.4 miles driven. Boom, boom, boom. That's it. Have a great rest of your day, guys. Peace.